where we left off. Last week I did the live teaching, so I don't know if everyone was able to see that or not. Uh, so we're in the book of Romans, so if you have your Bibles, you want to open up to the book of Romans, chapter 8. And I will backtrack just a little bit because it's, it's just tremendous. So in Romans, chapter 8, starting with verse 28. And this is what the Word of God says. And we know... That those, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Now I could stop right there, and I could I could I could go on and on for a couple hours just on that verse. So I want to point a few things out to you, and I want you to really pay attention to this. Where the Apostle Paul is saying, now you got to realize when the Apostle Paul is talking through these verses to the end of this chapter, he's talking a lot of this, a lot of this is from personal experience. So keep that in mind. This is not something that he just heard. It's personal experience that he's speaking about. Uh, this is Romans 8 verse 28. Okay? Now notice this. He says, and we know. No there's, no, there's no doubt here. There's no questioning. It's an absolute. We know that for those who love God, all things, not a few things, not just a couple of things, but all things work together for those who love, love the Lord. Last week I gave a little bit of a testimony about how that God will sometimes intervene in your life. Because if we tr truly believe the Word of God and God's purposes for our life, sometimes when we least expect it, when we're not prepared for it, when we haven't done due dil diligence for, to do something, God intervenes. And there's, there's a time and there's a, a season and then there's an appointed time that God will use you in a certain way that you didn't expect. Okay? So, for example, I gave this illustration that many, many years ago, when I was working in Atlanta, I was driving a truck, uh, I had a scheduled time to be at work. And I pride myself never being late. And out of, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years, I can only count on one hand how many times I've been late for work, and it's only been two times. Once, I actually overslept because I was lazy probably stayed up too late one night. The other time was by divine appointment. And I know that now. Where God put me in a deep sleep and didn't allow me to wake up until an appointed time that he chose that I needed to wake. And everything went wrong that day. When you think about how God works and how you plan your schedule and how you plan events and then God will somehow intervene. I didn't set my alarm clocks. And I had an electric alarm clock on top of the, the nightstand, and I had the Big Ben. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Some of uh, the people my age probably know it's the wind-up, has the big obnoxious bells on it. And when it goes off, it'll shake the bed. I kept it under the bed. I forgot to set it, okay? Uh, as, as best to my remembrance, or they just didn't go off, one or the other. Overslept. I missed the, the Atlanta route that I was supposed to take. And how I woke up was the phone rang and it was this dispatcher asking me, are you going to show up and come to work today? And uh, he, he was known for being a very rude, arrogant individual and it was very obnoxious the way he asked me. And I said, absolutely. So I got up, threw my clothes on. I don't even know if I brushed my teeth that day. Got in my car. And then what do you normally do? when you're running late, right? Pedal to the metal, right? And there I go right through a certain part of town where they're notorious to sit out there and what, what, wait for the speeders. And guess what happened? I got pulled over. And I'm thinking, you know, Lord, I'm a child of God. You know, why am I getting pulled over, right? But it doesn't work that way because I had an appointed time and the Lord was trying to slow me down because there was an appointment 
to be made that day. Okay? So, I got a ticket. And, you know, I, I deserved a ticket. <laughs> and then on the way, a tractor trailer crashed into the medium, flipped over the medium, and blocked the whole road. Oh, no. But I could have drove over on the side of the road and got around it. But I jumped out, and I helped the people get out. I was still being slowed down. Finally got there. They gave me the route. And like I always, I've always done this. As I'm driving, I'm praying, God. Now, I know there's normally three people that would help me unload one of these trucks. Lord, give me the words to speak. Help me. Get me out of the way. Take any pride, any selfishness that I might have. Take it away and let the Holy Spirit use me and speak through me life into, into the individuals. Let me have a witnessing opportunity. And I'm going to tell you, folks, if you pray that way, then you better get ready because God's going to open up the door and he's going to use you that way. Well, I got there that, that morning. There was only one person to help me. And I was witnessing them to him the whole time. I remember him. I've witnessed to him before. And uh, he, he would be always under conviction, but he would never repent. And then when I was about to leave, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He says, you go back and you talk to that boy and you tell him that I caused you to be here today. And I want you to tell him that I love him and that he needs to accept me because he's contemplating suicide when he, when he gets off that day. That terrified me. Because I never had the Lord speak to me in that sense before. But according to this verse, if we're willing, no matter what happens, God's got a plan for our lives. And we have to be ready. So whether we're in season or out of season, and trust me, that day I was out of season. And I was all twisted up in a knot. But God opened up the door. I was able to witness to that man. When I told him that the Lord sent me there, and the reason, because you're thinking about taking your life, his eyes went from this to ten times the size. And he thought, he, I, don't, I don't know exactly what he thought, but it scared him half to death. Because he didn't tell anybody that. But God sent me to tell him that God loves him. And that's the beautiful thing. So when the Apostle Paul is telling us, that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. On that day in my life, and you can think about times in your own life when God intervened and used you to bring about good for someone else's life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew... He also predestined. Now, I want you to understand this. We're going we're to talk a little bit about predestination. There are some churches that teach about predestin predestination, that certain people are predestined to be saved and to go to heaven, and that there's certain people that are predestined to die and go to hell. That is not what Scripture teaches. God's Word says that it's His, it's his will that all should come to everlasting life. Right? Mm -hmm. And we find so many other Scriptures... And we find so many other examples in Scripture where God's grace and His mercy is extended to the lost individuals. So that is the nature of God, and that is what we find as a whole in Scripture. So I'm going to give you a really good example here, and I'm going to tell you this. Every single person here was predestined to live for the Lord and serve Christ. And don't ever let the enemy tell you anything different, because that's a lie. And only lies come from the enemy, right? So, I want to explain this to you. For, the, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So we are to be conformed into the image of Christ. We are to be Christ-like. Jesus set the example. The Apostle Paul was a great example. We have a lot of great examples in Scripture, but mostly we are to, uh, to have our lives to be more Christ-like. So we can be the salt and the light to a darkening world. And we can make other people, if you're salty, what are you going to make other people? Thirsty. And thirsty for the things of God, right? 
That's what we want to be able to do. All right. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Romans 5.1. Remember we read about that? We now have peace with God. We have been justified through Christ. Right? And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All right. I got a picture of a little baby in a womb up there. Okay? One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. And I say that, but every verse is my, my favorite verse. I really can't have that. Uh, is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Where God spoke to Jeremiah. And as the Holy Spirit inspired Jeremiah to write, write the book of Jeremiah, this is what God said to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the belly or the womb, I knew you, and before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. It means to make you holy. And I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Hallelujah. So... That is God, for, he, he knew Jeremiah before he was even in his mother's womb. And the creator of the universe that created all things knew each and every one of us before we were in the womb. That's scripture. And there's other scriptures you find in the book of Job. You find other places where it says similar things. So God predestined you and me to live under the will of God to serve Christ and to serve others and to be a good servant of the Lord. Amen? Okay? That's what this is talking about here. It's not talking about that Brother Roger is a, is a low life and he is predestined to, to, to burn in hell. That's not what Scripture is talking about. I'm sorry, Roger. I just had to pick on you just for a second. That's not what it's talking about here. Hallelujah. I was going to try to play with the sound here, one of my favorite new songs, and that's uh, uh, The Goodness of God. I have the words up there, and if you really think about the words of that song, I think we could all say that that really relates to us. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. How many of you can say that? Your, his mercy never fails. Hallelujah. All my days I have been held in your, your, in your hands from the moment I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. And you think about that. If you are predestined by God to live for him, then he's had his hand on your life. And you think about it, go way, way back, if you could think about it, before you were saved. What doors, what roadblocks, what things had popped up to cause you to look at your life? And Brother Steve, I know you've got a, a bunch of them that uh, we're going to hear about. Uh, but what, what roadblocks can you think about that caused you to hear the word and God was knocking on your heart's door? You see, if you really think hard about it, you, you, you can, you can go back and remember. So I can go back and remember. I'm not going to go into great detail. But I can go back to the time that I was a very young, very young teenager. When the first born-again believer came up to me, invited me to a Bible study. And it's the first time I heard that you had to be born again. And I was raised Roman Catholic. Didn't know anything about that. I, I, th I thought you could live like the devil and then go sit and confess to a priest your sins and say six Hail Marys and you were fine, right? No, nope, you went to limbo. Well, yeah, 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 exactly. But I can still remember very vividly. Now, I forgot a lot of things in my youth, but that is burned in my memory and I'll never forget it. And I guarantee if you really think about it, before you were saved, you can remember when God met you at an intersection and caused an interruption somewhere. Right? So if you really, really think about it, that uh, I believe that you could think about that and, and come up with the same conclusion. All right, Romans 8:31. 
Again, if you have questions, I'm going to give some time here at the end and we'll, we'll answer some questions. Scripture says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, praise God. That should be something that we should all have posted somewhere, uh, whether it's on the dashboard of our car, our car or on the refrigerator or someplace. So when you feel the fiery darts of the enemy coming against you, when you feel depression coming, when you feel attacks from people that you work with, or whatever it may be, and you feel hatred and all that, just don't even worry about it. Because according to Scripture, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And that's a promise. This, this, is, this is scripture, and this is a promise. This is not just a mere suggestion. You know, Brother Roger, if, if God is, you know, if he's, if he's for us, he might be, you know, what is somebody else going to do? That's not what the scripture is saying. This is saying with absolute authority, if God is for us, who can be against us? So that is a scripture I think we should all try to memorize. And when you're being, being bombarded in the mind by Satan, by the enemy of your soul, you remember this verse. And if your life, if your heart's truly, if you're, if you're communing with God and if you turn your heart over to the Lord and you're trusting God for everything, then it doesn't matter who comes against you. So if you think about it, Christians and other nations that are suffering severe persecution... How do they get through it? They claim verses like this and other verses. And they stand on the promises of God. And they stand on God's word. And that's how they get through the difficult times. Amen. And God will make a way. And see, God says that, that no temptation will ever overpower you. But God will always make a way of escape for you. So even under persecution, you're being persecuted. You got to hold to those same promises that God will make a, a, a way and He'll make an escape. But yet, through persecution, we got to be faithful. But we got to realize that the persecutor, that individual, needs Christ just as much as I need Christ, and just as much as you need Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, verse thirty-two. <clears throat> he who did not spare his own son, speaking of the Father, not not. Uh, 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 he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So there you go. So that whole predestination thing that some churches teach is a lie according to this verse as well, and many other verses. So throughout Scripture we find that it's not God's will that any should perish. How will he not also with him graciously give us all thanks? So now, we have to understand what that passage is talking about. When you are walking in the Spirit, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and you are not walking according to the flesh, and your heart's desire is you want to see people saved, and people redeemed, and the bondages of slavery and sin are broken, when you want to see that take place, and you ask God, Lord, anoint me. Let me have the right words to speak to that person. Let the Holy Spirit convict that individual as the Holy Spirit speaks through me to that person. God is going to answer those prayers. But now if you say, Father, I want to, I want to drive a brand new Ferrari so that I can show off and be, be the talk of the town. And, uh, you know, I want to have a five million square foot house on top of a mountain someplace and I want to have cash just pouring out of my pockets that is selfish and God won't answer that prayer and he won't honor that does that make sense to everybody okay that's what scripture is talking about all right verse 33 who shall bring any charge against God's elect you think about that if we're in the family of God, we are God's elect. Who's going to bring an accusation or a charge? It'll be a false charge. It won't have any, any account. It won't have any, any authority in God's eyes. 
It is God who justifies. Not man. Not a religious leader. Not a priest. An ayatollah. Or any, anybody else. It's God who justifies. This is all about the Lord. It's not about any individual. Verse 34. Who is to condemn Jesus Christ? is the one who died more than that who was raised. So here's another scripture that tells us Jesus was raised from the dead. The New Testament is full of passages that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Wow, did you hear that? So Jesus is interceding for us. He's our high priest. He's our mediator. You know, in Catholicism, we believe that a man, a physical man, was the mediator between us and God. And that way we had to confess our sins to that man. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says that Jesus is the mediator. He's the one that intercedes for us. And I think if you go back and you read in the book of Acts, you'll see a great example of that. When the first Christian that was martyred, you remember his name? Stephen. And what was happening when Stephen was quoting the word of God and was, and was sharing with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters and all Israel and all the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and even the Apostle Paul, who was Saul at that time, was hearing the word of God. Who was standing at the right hand of God the Father? It was Jesus, and he was interceding on Stephen's behalf. He was getting ready to welcome Stephen into his presence. He's what a back. glorious time. He's back. He is back. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Well, hallelujah. So these, these are some awesome verses, and they are promises. So when you, when you think about this, and I, I, I want you to understand, when you read Scripture and you read uh, in the New Testament, and of course in the Old Testament as well. But when you read the promises of God, when God, when God's saying, I will, I shall, th there's no questioning that. If God says, I will do this, I shall do that, it's, it's, it's written in stone. Amen, brother. It is an absolute, there's no if and iffiness there. See, with a human being, we have iffiness. Uh, that's not a word. I just made it up. But I think everybody understands what I'm saying. There, there's no backtracking. With God, it's an absolute. So when God get, makes promises to us as, as Christians, it's written in stone. And you can bank on it and you can count on it. You can go deposit in the bank because it's an absolute. All right, verse 35. And I love verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So think about that. Who is going to separate us? No one. But now you can separate yourself. Now if you decide you're going to live according to the flesh, you will separate yourself from the love of Christ. If you decide you don't really want to be a 100% a sold out zealot for Christ, living for God, and talking about Jesus everywhere you go, and you decide that you want to live more in the flesh. You want to enjoy the things of this world. You want, you want to dabble in all the, the, the things that the world offers you as an individual. Then you will not be living according to God's will. And you'll be living outside of God's will. And I promise you, you'll be miserable until you repent. Just like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 12. No, I'm sorry, 15 I believe it is. The prodigal son was miserable. He had all this beautiful inheritance, and he went out and lived a life, an ungodly life. And he's seen that even the pigs had more food, and they were living better than he was living. And then he decided he was going to go ahead and return home, and his father welcomed him with open arms. That is a parable, but that is actually how God looks at us. So if a person is swallowing around in the mud and sin and ungodliness, all they have to do is call out to God. 
and this has to line up with this, and if that's what they really want to do and repent and serve God, God welcomes them to come back in. And the Bible says that even the angels in heaven will rejoice, and all of heaven will rejoice over one sinner that repents. You think about that. One sinner. So when, Roger, when you accepted Christ, all of heaven, all the hosts of heaven were shouting in praise Amen. that Roger gave his heart to the Lord. D, when you repented, same thing. All of us, when we repented, all of heaven rejoiced. I can't even comprehend that. I know what scripture says, but to actually be able to understand how that actually took the place is beyond my comprehension. But I know it's a beautiful thing. And, and you know, in the Father's house rejoicing with his ring on the Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You know, Praise what's, God. Interesting? <laughs> what's interesting is in that uh, verse you just said was, was the pigs. He was with the pigs. You go further into the Bible, and when Legion lets go of the demon, right, they right. go into the pigs. Right. And pigs, all throughout Judaism, were considered right. dirty animals. Right. So this is used constantly throughout the Bible. Amen. That's exactly right. Well, even pigs don't want to have demons inside of them. Yeah. Right? They ran yeah. off the cliff. Right. All right. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? No. Or persecution? No. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or danger? No. Or sword? No. Now this is the Apostle Paul talking about his own experience. He went through every one of these. And even all of those that went with Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, Luke, Titus, all of those, even the individual that wrote the book of Romans under Paul's, uh, as Paul dictated it, um, and I can't pronounce his name, but all of them suffered as Christians to get the gospel message out. But yet they counted it all joy because they knew they were serving God and they knew that uh, the Lord was using them in a mighty way and that people's lives were being changed. They seen pagan worshipers, idol worshipers, people that were worshiping false gods, now cast those things aside and accept Jesus. And immediately there was a change in their life where depression and anger and all those, the fruits of, of an ungodly life were evident. That fruit all disappeared and now all Christian fruit started to appear on, in those individuals' lives. That's what gave these men the motivation to continue to go on is because they seen what God was doing in people's lives. Even though they suffered, that everyone else might receive great victory and joy. Hopefully that makes sense. Verse 36. As it is written, and I love that. So now the Apostle Paul is quoting Scripture. He's quoting Old Testament Scripture. And he's quoting Psalms 42, verse 22 here. He says, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. So as Christians, we are considered sheep. And sheep are going to be, well, let me just put it this way. If you're a Christian today, in this, this very day, in, in January 2022, and you are known for being a Christian outside of your home, outside of this church, you're going to be persecuted. People are not going to like you. People are going to say things about you. They're going to say, oh, that Daryl, here he comes again. He's probably going to got a scripture he's going to quote to us. <clears throat> he's probably going to tell us that Jesus loves us. They're going to say all kinds of things about us. We will, su we will suffer persecution. It'll start verbally, and then it may get to a, a different point at some point if the Lord was to tarry and delay his coming, which I don't believe he will. Right now in Canada, we see persecution <laughs> taking place where pastors are going to be locked up if they say certain things about other groups. So if, you start, if you're a pastor in Canada and you say things that 
you know, this particular thing is a sin. And if somebody's in that church and is practicing that, they can pick up the phone and call the police. They'll come take that pastor and put him in jail. So they're losing their freedom of speech. And we can see, if we have the discernment and our eyes are open, we can see that freedom of speech is, erap is evaporating quickly here in America. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be allowed to say certain mm -hmm. things. And it's been tested and it's been tried in certain cities. And there's been some uh, barking back, but it's going to come. Mm -hmm. So Christians, it's time to bear down. It's time to draw closer to God than we've ever been before. The time of straddling the fence has come to an end. You either got to jump over into the world and get on that broad road that leads to destruction, or you've got to jump over the other side of the fence and be on the straight, narrow path. And you got to be prepared because there's going to be persecution that will come. Sooner or later, it'll happen. Verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Praise God. For I am sure that neither death or life or angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah. So no matter what, what lies ahead, I told you that little story about me years ago that God intervened in my life. We're going to all have times where God's going to intervene. And again, it'll be at a time, it'll be in a season when you're probably really not necessarily preparing for that but you got to be ready ahead of time so when that comes and when you least expect it it will come that's exactly right least expected expected that's exactly there you go that's exactly right god wants to use us the the time clock of the the, the church age is about to, to stop okay uh amen brother so we are running out of time, and what we're going to do, and you hear me say this, and I know I sound like a broken record, but if we're going to do anything for the Lord, we got to do it now. And I'm going to tell you, that, like I said earlier, the time of being a nominal Christian, which means Christian in name only, or the time of being one of these cruise trip Christians, where everything is is whipped cream, and, and uh, you, you're, yeah, I, I won't even go there. But the time of you, the time for you to get serious with God is today. No matter what. We have to get serious with God because we are absolutely running out of time. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. I think we finished chapter 8. Questions?